If you want to know how the squatting scams work, listen to today's episode. Make sure you pay attention. You do not want to be a victim of a squatting scam. And we talk about how to keep yourself safe and prevent this from happening to you. All right. Welcome to another episode of the Accidental Landlord Podcast. Today we have George McCleary, uh, who has some expertise around a topic that a lot of people have interest in, and that's squatters. So George, welcome to the show. Hey, happy to be here, man. Yeah, we're happy to have you here. Um, why don't you take a minute or two to introduce yourself and give a quick background on who you are, kind of what you're all about, and you kind of go from there. Sure thing. So um, I'm a real estate investor of about 20 years, uh, mainly here in Portland, Oregon. I've invested out of state, but mainly here in the Pacific Northwest. And uh, if you do business in a blue state and you're in real estate and you're governed by a set of laws that sometimes can get a little uh, a little tough to deal with if you are in uh uh, in property management, real estate, and brokerage. And so I made a video one day, um, it was uh, earlier this year, I think it was actually on Super Bowl Sunday, that went um, massively viral, tens of millions of views all over Twitter and all over the internet. It was about um, a stealing houses, essentially, the ease with which squatters can take over a house in Portland and uh, just claim ownership to it, claim tenancy, and it just caught fire. And so, and I went on a bunch of cable news programs. Uh, Fox News called. I got on um, News Nation. Um, it was they talked about me on Joe Rogan. It was a real big firestorm. And with with that came a flood of uh, of information about just how bad this squatter problem actually was, and how it was affecting people, and to what extent. People are losing tens, if not hundreds of thousands of dollars over it. So I really kind of dug into that. So now um, what I'm doing now is I'm helping people with squatters. Nice. I like it. I, so it's always fascinating to me where little niches come from, right? Like you didn't wake up one day and go, I'm going to be the squatting expert. It just no, kind sir. of it just kind of happened. And then you were like, oh, there's something here. Oh, I'm going to lean into this. Well, it's not my plan, but here we are. Yeah. Now, did, did you have squatters in one of your properties or this is just a video, random video you made about a topic? It was a random video I made about a topic. I've never, thankfully, had squatters myself. I've had holdover tenants, and I've had a host of problems just owning rental mm-hmm. property here in Portland, but never actually squatters per se, knock on wood. But I do have several friends that do business in Portland and Seattle, and they've shared their squatter stories with me uh, before the video went viral. And then uh, since the video went viral, I've heard a ton from people both that I know and that I've never met. But luckily, I've never been afflicted. Yeah, yeah. So are, do you just invest on your own? Or are you a real estate? agent or kind of what is your is this your full-time job or what does that look like yeah so i'm a full-time real estate investor i'm a licensed broker but it really it's i'm really just kind of buying and selling my own stuff gotcha. uh flips new development um i'm doing uh, bigger apartment complexes now um an industrial development as well to kind of pivot away from multifamily a little bit and so a little little bit of everything within within the confines of uh residential mostly awesome. Awesome. So I want to dive into squatting, uh, but uh, later on, so you could help me not forget, I want to talk about what it looks like to be a professional investor in a extremely tenant friendly area like you are. Mm -hmm. Oregon is, you know, rivals California on some things, but we might have you beat on tenant friendly laws. I don't know exactly. but If that's even possible. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) But the, the, what I want to talk about, because this comes up on our YouTube comments a lot, because we bring a lot of awareness to you know, laws that California is passing to keep people like you and me safe and not breaking, you know, breaking the rules and you don't even know about it. And inevitably, a bunch of people say the same thing. You need to leave California, go invest somewhere where it's landlord friendly. And I, I, we just finished, it's not out yet, making a, a video slash blog about this very topic. And the premise of it is, yes, we are in a very landlord or tenant friendly state. Yes, there's a lot of regulation. Yes, there's a lot of problems. But it doesn't mean that you can't do really well as an investor. And I think you're you're probably a perfect example of that because Portland's like one of the worst cities out there, I would imagine, for this type of thing when it comes to rent control and just weird laws. But here you are, right? You're making it work. Speak to that a little bit before we get into the squatter thing. Can do. Yeah. So no, I do have a lot of thoughts on that. And so what all those landlord tenant laws do is they, they, they aggravate us and they don't, they make it tougher to do business as a landlord. But at the same time, these municipalities are very, very good at um, having those both restrict the supply 
that's coming on the market, new builds, new apartments, new homes, um, just because the prices, um, SDCs and permits to build a new unit, whether it's an apartment or a house, is extraordinarily high. And so that's an impediment to development. And then also landlord-tenant laws that are unfavorable um, that leads to fewer people wanting to invest in that area. However, people are still flocking to these areas and wanting to live there. And so you know what happens if you restrict supply and demand remains steady or goes up, the prices go up. And so what we deal with in aggravation, I'd say, is uh, really counterbalanced and then some by the fact that we live in appreciation markets. And I've, I've invested out of state into markets where, you know, it doesn't really appreciate a whole lot. And you've got, uh, you know, you're just dependent on your cash flow. But all of that really evaporates as soon as one guy trashes his unit and uh, you got to go renovate it. And you realize that it hasn't gone up in value by, you know, more than 10 grand over three years. And you think to yourself, heck, you know, maybe this isn't so hot. And I've had it both ways in my career. And yeah, you know, you can tell me all day, like, hey, don't invest in Oregon, Washington, California. And I said, I just, you know, hey, don't make me tap the, tap the sign. Like <laughs> the sign says, all our property values have increased um, dramatically over that of other states. And not just that, but our basis is higher. And so we've gone up by, you know, several hundred thousand dollars while you've gone up by, you know, thirty thousand dollars because you know the house is worth a hundred grand because nobody wants to live there so we're overplaying our hand in terms of how desirable our areas are to live in and that's that's very clear and that's what comes in the forms of these landlord tenant laws but it's still worthwhile to invest in these areas just due to dollars and cents yeah i think it's a moat that you have to cross and there's a lot of people who aren't willing to cross it right the mm -hmm. people who are willing to cross it people like you and me and other investors who stay here and invest they're rewarded for it Do, is it harder sure it's harder but is it impossible no it's not impossible there are pe people doing it every day in every town all across the united states there is a strategy that works everywhere i've never come across somewhere where there's never been a real estate investor right like somebody's investing in real estate in every single market you just have to make sure you're connecting with the right people you know being a sponge learning what's working and then it's doable but yeah i would take because so i've probably gone down a similar journey to you i was investing out of state for a while same experience you're relying on the cash flow you you have one bad eviction wipe out a year's worth of of any profits you have it's just in the end for me not worth it. I'd much rather do stuff, something in my backyard that I have complete control over. And then you're getting crazy appreciation and not just in the, in the value of the house, but the rent has appreciated dramatically over the last 10 years too. So my opinion that outweighs the negative regulatory environment that we're in all day exactly. long. Yeah, I think it's still our duty as investors to really kind of fight that type of um, poor regulation. And some of the some of the really um, ill-advised policies have been pulled back. Like we legalized drugs up here for a while or decriminalized drugs for a while, realized that was a terrible idea, and then we pulled it back. So the collective consciousness of the public eventually does get wise to things that are really terrible ideas. Um, sometimes it just okay, takes a minute. Expand on that. I'm just cu out of curiosity. So what, what did legalized drugs mean? Like, what did that mean exactly? Well, we, we decriminalized um, uh, possession of uh, fentanyl, heroin, methamphetamine, and it was a quote-unquote diversion program they had to go to, but really nothing happened. They issued a $100 ticket with a 1-800 number, and um, per call for the 1-800 number, like 1-800-GET-CLEAN-FROM-METH um, was like, turned out to be like seven thousand dollars per call oh, per call it was God. just a huge waste of money and so and everybody was seeing what was happening on the streets people were dying and so no matter what side of the aisle that you're on you see addicts languishing and dying and not getting forced into treatment um you're gonna think to yourself hey maybe this isn't the way maybe this isn't the way to go i can't take my kids downtown anymore and since then it's been really glacial but there has been a, a movement to clean things up and it's been working and it's because people are the police are now empowered to you know to to cite and arrest addicts they're not going to go to jail for 10 years like they were before because you know i think that's a little much but they are going to get in trouble if they just continue to you know act a fool and continue using publicly so uh it's going to take longer to completely clean things up and i know you guys down in socal are having similar struggles but um these policies, you know, the pendulum swings one way and yeah. often it swings back. So keep yeah. the faith. Yeah. Yeah. No, I'm with you. Like 
not about drug use, but just about rent control and all this hyper regulation, like it's back in my opinion, it's it's backfiring and it's going to it's going to only get worse. And I, I am optimistic about a time where they go, huh? OK, that's not really working. We did all the things because we're, you know, the governor, both legislative houses are all left leaning They They pass whatever laws they want. They're not. It's not working. The housing prices aren't coming down. The the supply is not all of a sudden, you know, abundant. So uh, my hope is eventually they'll go. Okay, let's let's look at other op- options here and, and swing. Maybe just back to the center. It doesn't have to go all the way over. But yeah, maybe a these economists. The maybe these economists really did have some idea what they were yeah. talking about. Yeah, yeah. Universally, they all say rent control is a bad idea. Yet the politicians are like, "This is the greatest idea ever." Yeah, Anyhow, all right. Box. Yeah. So we've, we we haven't talked one thing about squatting. Let's get back to squatting. So uh, yeah, what's the scam? Roll it out. How does so it work? Basically, it's it's faking a contract. It's uh, So let's draw this distinction first between a holdover tenant and a squatter. So a holdover tenant, uh, the guy didn't leave. He's not holding up his end of the bargain. So you got you to gotta take him to court and you got to kick him out, try and get some money from him, whatever. Squatting, there's no contract. You just enter into a house and you just claim it as your own. You just claim tenancy. And so when the police show up and you say like, hey, um, this is my home, uh, but the police are not empowered to take people out of their homes and arrest them unless they have a very clear understanding of what's going on and that a crime has been committed. So most of the time you've got one guy saying like, hey, this is this is my building and this guy, this is my house and this guy doesn't belong here, he doesn't have a lease. And one guy says, yeah, I do, sure I do, here it is. And they either give him a fake lease or a sob story and the cop, he doesn't want to arrest a guy or put his job on the line to get rid of the guy so um, or to arrest him. So so the, the squatter remains, and then the landlord calls up his property manager or people he knows and says, hey, what should I do? And they're like, well, uh, you can either go through ejectment or eviction. And if you go through ejectment, which is, you know, there's never a contract, that's what you should do. It's a long docket process, and it takes a long time to get rid of the guy. Meanwhile, you can't rent out the place. He's having his buddies move in. They're trashing the place. And these homeowners are just completely powerless uh, to fix it. So that's the scam. What? What, what you said eject ejectment what's the difference between that and eviction so ejectment means there's no, there is never any uh, there's never any right there to be there in the first place and you would think something like that would be really quick like oh he never had any right to occupy the place at all all right he's out no for whatever reason because those cases are rarer possibly that is a much longer process than a simple eviction in some places like in idaho i think you can get an eviction done in like six weeks or something pretty quick but in other cases other places they can uh they can punt they can do a continuance they call it uh where they just kick the court date down like another five months you know just because and that allows the, the squatter to stay in a whole lot longer so it actually makes sense to go with eviction over ejectment Hmm. So that's interesting. So I've never heard of ejectment. I know the way that squatters are handled here is you have to put them through the regular eviction process. You serve them a three day, you do, but I, I've never heard, maybe that's a Oregon thing. I'm not exactly sure, but uh, interesting to, to look into. I know in California, it's same thing. They say, yeah, no, I have a right to be here. They'll go as far as, you know, breaking in, changing the locks, putting the utilities in their name, um, making a fake lease. Then the police show up. Same thing. You said, nope, I got a lease. Police aren't going to do a he said, she said thing. They go, you guys, you can duke this out in civil court and we're out of here. Sorry. Um, Yeah, that's essentially the scam. And and unfortunately, it it works, right? It buys time. In my opinion, it, it just buys you the length of a normal eviction process, right? The problem is if they get a lawyer, which there's plenty of lawyers that are, you know, work pro bono for for tenants although i don't i'd be interested to know if they take a clear squatting case where they're going to lose well have you do you have any experience with that or yeah no there's plenty of lawyers that'll take it on there's uh publicly funded agencies that with taxpayer money that'll uh not only uh take on uh existing cases but also advise squatters up front and say like hey um yeah if you want some housing and you want to be free like you know here's what you do and they tell them how to skirt the law. And there's a there's an organization up in Seattle called the Housing Justice Project. And there's a famous case up there with my friend Leica, uh, who I interviewed. And she uh, she was told by her squatters that they were getting advice from them the whole time. Which I think that's just so wrong on so many levels. Like if you uh, like a, a legal society, a legal group that's helping tenants, cool, nothing wrong with that. But to help criminals 
<laughs> that's it's that's over it's the line. Bizarre. It's, yeah. it, it's unreal. Yeah, that's crazy. What do you do? So how do you prevent this from happening? What What is your recommendations for people? So yeah, when it comes to squatters, I basically got, uh, it's a three pronged approach. It's uh, prevention, detection, and ejection. So the prevention part, that is, uh, that's pretty simple, but there's, uh, but there's mul multiple facets to it. But the biggest piece, and it's so, it's so simple, the biggest piece to it is just simply having an alarm system. And not like a big fancy installed, you know, $5,000 system, just like a $100 system from Simply Safe that you plug into the wall that has a motion sensor and a siren. Because if you have a record of somebody entering the place, tripping a motion sensor, then you actually have something to show to the police, like, hey, this guy is not supposed to be here. And in generally, generally people don't want to stick around when an, uh, a siren is blaring. And if you have, you know, several vacant units, you can move the system from one unit to another and you can have alerts to your phone. You can pay for monitoring. There's all these little bells and whistles, but really at the end of the day, if you're, you're lazy and you just want the easiest coverage as, as possible, just get the thing, get the thing from the alarm company, plug it into the wall. And if somebody trips it, you know, trips the motion sensor, it's on your phone. So you go solve the problem because time it's really all about time. If they get their stuff and their friends and, you know, their furniture moved in, it becomes a whole lot more plausible for any police officer. Like, yeah, you know, these, uh, these guys actually do live here. Look, there's a couch. But if, they, but if you're on top of it, you get an alert. Hey, someone's in my place. I didn't call a handyman. And if you've got a camera, that's another little piece that you can add for like 50 bucks. And suddenly you can see what's going on. And there's more to it than that. But that's, that's the simplest little Band-Aid on the prevention side. Yeah, you. Our advice is, and, and we'll talk about a new law they passed in California. Is you, you can't be like an absent. You can't have your head in the sand. Like if you have a vacant rental property, it's the most vulnerable you'll be as, in your journey as a landlord. Like nothing good comes from vacancies, which is why it's really important that you price it correctly so it rents right away. Like sometimes I see a landlord, a self-managing landlord who's maybe this is their first time, and they're like thinking their property's worth you know three times what it's actually worth, and not only will it never rent at that price, but it also opens you up to a lot of bad things. Like these, these scammers aren't dumb. They know when something's overpriced that their sob story might work on the landlord because they're desperate because they think their property is worth something. You know, yeah. it's always a, a red flag to us if somebody's willing to pay more than something's worth. Oh yeah. And you can see on Zillow how long it's been listed. And you know, the criminals might not be acquainted with market value very closely, but they know that if it's been there for like three months, yeah. Like, you know, that's, that's right for the plucking. And, uh, there's a decent chance that that person is just trying to rent it out for what their mortgage payment is, which really rarely works, especially yeah. in California. So yeah, yeah they're going to be like, okay, that's a good target. And I don't think these people are showing up there very often. So off I go. Yeah. Um, that our so our advice is, is we monitor your vacancies, <laughs> know what's going on there. You know, don't, if you don't have any showings or there's no activity, that's a red flag. You need to do something about that. Right. The uh, yeah yeah uh, I do like the advice of just put a ring camera or some some cheap alarm because if you can jump on it quick and then you can quickly show the cop no nope, here he is breaking in right here look at it this was today or yesterday or whatever you're much more likely to to be successful you're much more likely that. to be successful and with those with that footage like if uh, I don't know if you've had to call the police lately but. If you've got some footage of some stuff that's that's happening, you can text it to the cop. They will yeah. they'll take that and they'll be like, okay, you know, clearly something's wrong here. Yeah. There's a guy with a, an alarm blaring in the background, you know, looking around, I'll feel like you know, I think I think something's wrong. Maybe yeah. I shouldn't be here. Uh, let's talk about so California just passed a, a new law January of 2024 called uh, it's Senate Bill 602, and essentially what it is. It remains to be seen how effective it is. Just because they pass a law doesn't mean it's necessarily a good idea, clearly. Mm. Um, but basically, you can put a five, like prior to this law passing, you could put like a no trespassing order. I don't know what the right terminology is, a, a, a document with the police department or the county or whoever the, the law enforcement agency is that says, hey, this is my property. It's vacant. If somebody's there, they're not supposed to be there. And you can you have my permission to get rid of them. Well, they just passed a law that extended that from a 30 day window to of a full 12 months. Or I think if it's a permanently closed building, which is probably not a rental property, they'll keep it on file for three years. So 
the problem with it is every city is different. So like we manage properties in 15 different cities in our area. So every one of them has different rules regarding it. Some make it easy, some make it difficult. And I, I'm not convinced that this would work in this situation. Like if you said, yeah, I have, because the problem is your property is not vacant all the time. Your property hopefully is vacant for less than 30 days once every three or four or five years in a perfect scenario. So it would take a pretty proactive landlord to keep this thing on file all the time. And most of the time you would have a tenant in place who's legally supposed to be there. So like the the situations where it would apply, I feel would be pretty limited, but that's California's attempt to to make it a little better, which I applaud them. The fact that they even tried is a victory for us. Um, I mean, I suppose I know Flo- it's a step in the right direction, but still yeah, it doesn't seem much like it has step, much teeth. Little baby step, maybe. Uh, Florida just pa- passed a law. Are you familiar with that one? Yeah, sure am. Do, can you speak to that a little bit? Yeah. So in Florida, um, what you do is if, if you have a squatter is you file a form with the sheriff's office and the sheriffs uh, just go and kick them out. And so the difference between uh, that and what you do with a squatter in any other state is that when the sheriff shows up, he's got to he's got to uh, kind of sort out like, OK, is this guy supposed to be here? Is he actually a squatter? Is he not? But with the form filed with the sheriff, if you are, in fact, kicking out somebody with a contractual right to be there, like, yeah, you're going to get in trouble, but it shifts the burden of proof to the person who's there. And so the squatter has to has to prove that they that like after the fact that they have that they had the right to be there. And so by then they will have been kicked out. And if uh, there's, you know, a bad actor landlord that's, you know, just kicking people out for no good reason, then yeah, they're going to be facing consequences. But I mean, <laughs> landlords don't do that. They like, they know, and especially in this day and age, that they're going to get in trouble if they, you know, if they break the law. And so what the Florida law does is it, it empowers the sheriff to kick pe- and to kick out squatters without having to face any potential uh, repercussions. It gives them uh, the confidence to know that they're kicking out somebody with no right to be there. And if it's, and if they do have the right to be there, it's not their fault. Yeah. I, I, I vividly remember watching a news conference with uh, DeSantis talking about this issue, which is, I think it's a, it's, it's a big step in the right direction for them. Uh, there's I a, saw that news conference. Yeah, that was great. Yeah. Yeah, there's groups now in our area. I was just looking them up online. The Squatter Squad. Have you heard of these groups? Yeah, I know. Yeah, no, there's guys uh, nationwide that are uh, th- that are removing squatters uh, down in California. There's a couple guys down there that are. That are How doing are they it. doing it? What what are they What are they doing to make it happen? I kind of so have an idea. Just... There's a couple different strategies, but they're all kind of based around the same idea, and that is uh, it's kind of based around possession being nine tenths of the law. If so them and the other uh, squads that are doing this around the country, but mainly them, they're flying to different cities and uh, helping people with their squatters. But essentially, they're getting a bunch of dudes and they're they're moving in. They move into the house and they squat on the squatter. And this is definitely like a gray area because what they're doing is essentially the exact same thing as what the squatters are doing. However, they're doing it with a lease in hand. They're getting a lease from the owner and the owner says, yep, you can go in there. It's, it's your place now. And either they kick the people out or they just make life really uncomfortable for them for the squatter and then eventually they take off and and i've heard about cases of people doing that where they just remove all the belongings and put them on the street i've heard about people moving in and uh filling the house with snakes uh there's all sorts of like when i went viral i was on the receiving end of every story and anecdote that you've ever heard Uh, strangers were writing me you know like wall of text uh dms Hey, you won't believe what happened to me and my grandma. And it was all sort of based around the same thing. You, you, you go in there and you, and you move in. And to date, I have yet to hear. So I've, I have heard about cases where like something like this has gone wrong. Like the squatters have like shot somebody or they've been held liable because, you know, the squatter stepped in like a bear trap or something like that. Like things where people got hurt and there was liability at stake. I haven't yet heard uh, this happening with the squatter squad or any like, I guess, trained professionals that are doing this uh, more or less, quote unquote, by the book. Uh, But make no mistake, there's no real book here. (laughs) They're kind of uh, just they're just kind of going for it. Yeah, that's my understanding is they just just post up inside the house. I mean, it sounds unsafe. Like I personally probably wouldn't do it. But if this is what they do and they, they know how to do it, like I think it's. 
it's a good tool. Like the laws aren't on your side. And if this is an option, why not? You know? Yeah. And I've been Um, telling people, they say, Hey, well, can you help me with my squatters? And up until recently I've had, I've had to say, well, you know, no, I mean, it's not going to be me that goes in and, uh, goes into the house and tries to get rid of a squatter. That's, that's never going to be my job. However, just in the course of, uh, building my squatter defender product, it's, uh, it's become readily apparent that I need to have people like boots on the ground that can actually remove the squatters. And so I built a network nationwide of people that are willing to do that. And so Mm -hmm. if anybody does have a squatter at this point, yes, they can call me and it's, uh, it's, it's not dirt cheap, but it's usually a whole lot less expensive than going through the court process and foregoing rent on your place for, are you then partnering with groups like squatter squad and people like that? Is that kind of the strategy or not squatter squad specifically, but Hey, I'd love to talk to them, <laughs> but yeah, but, uh, <laughs> but, but, but that's groups the idea that, are, that, that have that, that general playbook. Yeah. Squat on the squatter, install a bunch of cameras, you know, make life unpleasant for them and, uh, get them out. The un, that's, that's what we call the, in the unconventional methods of uh, getting rid of the squatter. The conventional just being the typical eviction process. Yeah. Typical through. is, you know, hire a lawyer, pay him 40 grand and have him eventually get out into like three, six, 12, 18 months. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Which and and destroy your house in the process. And destroy your house. So, uh, what what are your service? I didn't actually realize you had this service. So, what do your services look like? Like, what cost wise? What are, what does it look like to do this? So, if uh, if it's if it's really just a, a one and done type situation, like really quick, it's like going to be a minimum of about five k, and then it goes up to like you know fifteen or twenty if it's a real if it's a real bee's nest, and it really just depends. But, you know, we're offering financing because not everybody has got 15 K just kicking around. But Mm -hmm. generally, if you're, if you're, if you're wanting to get rid of them and you want a, like a done solution and you want quick, then yeah, give me a call. (laughs) I, I, I think this is, I mean, I think it's unfortunate that you even have to have a service like this, right? Like the fact that this exists is a problem, right? Because it shouldn't have happened. It shouldn't be there in the first place. Shouldn't even be there. Shouldn't be a thing. (laughs) It's the world we live in. My guess is. As this becomes more common, which it absolutely will, because people aren't just going to tolerate their properties being stolen from them, then maybe the the politicians will act and, and try to go, OK, we have a problem. We have like warring factions at all these rental properties. You know, people are getting hurt, whatever. OK, let's let's actually. Yeah, maybe we should do something about this. But actually, yeah. <laughs> but the front end of this thing is my squatter defender training course. And that's where I train people uh, the protection, detection and ejection, just all facets. And that's for owners, property managers. Yeah. And that's just to get a full rundown of like, OK, what is this scam? How do you deal with it? How do you prevent it? And if you have it, like, what are your options? Because a lot of yeah. people are going to look at you know the methodology me- methodology of the uh, the squatter squads and say like whoa uh, yeah that's not for me like what like what are what are my options here what are what have people done and I've got and I basically highlight just the the most uh, I guess common and prevalent uh, ways of doing it both conventionally and unconventionally and you can just kind of take your pick once you've kind of heard the yeah. full buffet of options. But, you know, one of those options, a lot of these options are really boring and really not that great. And one of them is cash for keys. That's paying the squatter to get out of there. And as much as it pains me to say like, hey, this is actually a really great option. Like, what are these people really after? They just want money and housing. They're desperate people. So if you cut them a check for five or 10 K, like probably saved yourself a little bit of money. Yeah. So I was not specifically about squatters, but I was with my wife at the grocery store the other day and um on the like cash register like for the cashiers that's like look out for these scams and it was like i don't know a full small type page like that they're supposed to be looking out for and then we own a property management company we know the scams like it's the same there's probably three or four scams that they pull on landlord slash property managers and we know what to look out for and then here's squatting i don't really equate squatting as one of those scams it's definitely a scam but not the ones I'm thinking of. And then we just rolled out an Airbnb or my wife's managing our first Airbnb and there's the scams with Airbnbs. It's like, it's so disappointing that like every aspect of society, you have people who are trying to get something for nothing, trying to oh, take yeah. advantage of somebody. It, it, anything you do, there's somebody trying to scam you for it, whether it's an old lady, you know, trying to steal her tax return or what there's just, it's so disappointing. It's, it's just a bit not, obviously, depressing. <laughs> it is. Yeah, it, it makes you lose faith in people, right? Like, I generally think most people are good and want to do the right thing, but then, you know. 
Most yeah. people are good, and I, I really, I really do think that. But I think that when you get to the intersection of, uh, you know, the X and Y axis of um, how profitable a crime is, and then your likelihood of getting caught, and what happens to you if you get caught, the tr the crime attracts more and more people. If the crime, if the punishment doesn't really fit the crime, if the punishment's down here, but the crime can pay this well, like uh, the example I give in my squatter defender courses, you know, hey. If it turns out that you know you could have like three months probation for robbing a bank for fifty grand, do you think more people would be robbing banks? Yeah, there would be an absolute scourge. Like banks would stop having cash on hand, just full stop. And so that's what it is with squattering because it becomes a civil matter rather than a criminal matter when you're trying to go through the conventional process of getting rid of these squatters. And so you can't you could go after the squatter like after the fact and say like oh hey you ripped me off for like you know 50 grand but the squatter doesn't have any money it'd be drawing water from a stone you can't do that. And so the financial loss and the fraud that's been perpetrated upon you just there's no there's no recompense you can't be compensated for that. And so the squatter gets off squat free, you lose a ton of uh, time and money and aggravation and the the punishment is usually non-existent so that's why the squ this particular crime and scam has just become so prevalent yeah yeah no yeah yeah i couldn't agree more the the bummer is is like what are you te you know half the time they have kids and there's other people you know like what are you teaching what kind of example are you setting what are you teaching your people who look up to you but Oh yeah, yeah. Like like porch pirates. I've seen videos of them opening the the, the stolen goods in front of their kids, and I'm thinking, holy smokes. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, crazy. Um, let's let's pivot a little bit. What what's it like to go viral? Like, what did that? How did your life change after that? And then how long did it take to return back to normal? <laughs> uh, about two weeks. <laughs> For about two weeks, I felt like I was. Uh, it was uh, more attention than I've ever received in my entire life. Um, everybody both that I knew and didn't know just had something to say about me. And like a lot of people really didn't like get the joke of the video. Cause in the video I pretend like I'm stealing a house. I'm like, this is how I stole a house. And I go through the whole motions. There is a very large faction of people more than I expected that really thought that I stole, that I stole the house. And so they're leaving comments like someone needs to shoot this guy or we need to go sort this guy out. And I'm like, Yo, like <laughs> you're obviously like not paying very close attention here. Like click on my page. I'm a real estate investor. I got thousands of followers. Like, like I'm not that guy. I'm pretending to be okay. But yeah. So after that, you know, I was having dinner with my wife like a day or two after I went viral, the whole firestorm's brewing. I was booked on Fox news and she's, and she's like, is this like, is anybody going to like try and like find us or hurt us? And I said, of, like, of course not. But in the back of my mind, I thought like, the chances are no longer zero that like, you know, that I can, that I can say like no one will ever find us or, or anything. And actually not too long after that, uh, my mail carrier, uh, was like, I rang, uh, he like, uh, had like a certified letter and he says, Hey, um, did this house get stolen? And I'm like, Oh man, uh, no, I'm so I'm the guy in the video. He's like, oh, that is you. That's, that's totally you. So did you steal this place? I'm like, Oh dude, no, like this is my house. Like I'm on the deed. And he says, Oh, okay, cool. Yeah. Cause I recognized that house on my route from the video. And I'm like, wow, damn. So there is for every person that I actually heard from, uh, I'm sure there was thousands more that just kind of saw it. And so, but that's, but then all the flood of, uh, attention and information that kind of came my way is what really kind of set the light bulb off on my head. Like, yo, this is an underserved issue. This is an underserved market. And, you know, I really, I can simultaneously kind of take some of the, uh, I guess pent up anger and aggression from seeing my city, uh, like, you know, be so much less fun and less and less clean than it used to be on account of like, you know, really poor policy, um, on account of just, you know, all these laws they made for, you know, landlords and drugs and take some of that and channel it into like a program and to a vocation that can really help property owners and, you know, help with this problem in particular. Yeah. Um, I'm always amazed at how much, so we make YouTube videos and this podcast goes on YouTube and yeah, oh, I've seen some, them. Of, some of them get good traction. Some of them don't, but I'm always amazed at people just like when they get behind that keyboard, they don't have any problem being super aggressive, super. They don't care if they'll read you up one side and down the other about how terrible you are. You don't know anything. And like half the time, I don't even think they've watched the video. Cause like the points they're trying to make are like in, in exact opposite of what we're trying to do or 
it, it's it's disappointing but it, it is I think yeah. it goes with the territory for sure it does so, and i've become like i haven't become like numb to it like it still affects me but it affects me a whole lot less now than it used to um I've, it, it gave me a much thicker skin and i think that's a good thing because people say yeah. really god awful things i can't even mention here and it's uh you know it really kind of shook my faith in in uh society but then after it happened for like the 10,000th time, I was just like, okay, you know, I got a choice here. I can really like let this kind of rock me to the core or, you know, I can, you know, you know, get a, you know, just hold my chin up and just kind of keep moving forward and figure there's just some really, some really angry people out there. But the other 90 some percent of it were people that's like, Hey man, this is great. You know, that's, that's yeah. super messed up that they do that. Like, I'm glad you're speaking out. And then, you know, it sounds like a, a business opportunity came out of it. You, it you recognize the need and you figured out a way you can help and make a little money off it on top of that. That's that's the American dream, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. So real quick plug on the squatter defender course that helps you sure. helps you with squatters. And then uh, another part of it that I learned is all about uh, deed fraud and how that's perpetrated, where you're stealing somebody's house via the deed. And that one is really particularly heinous because you steal. Let, why, why don't you, why don't you uh, lay that one out for us? So deed fraud is when um, you take, you, you falsify a deed, you forge the notary signature, the notary stamp, and you take it down to the county and say like, yeah, Peter's house, he sold it to me for 200 grand. And so they take it and they say, they file it and they're like, great. All right. It's in your, it's in, in your name now, George, or the alias that, you know, that you have, cause you don't have to show ID or anything. And then once you have it in your name, you can either live there and have a very rock solid, uh, squatter, a squatter story for the cops. Say like, I'm, I'm on the deed. I bought this place or, um, uh, which is much more heinous. You sell the property either on the retail market or to a wholesaler, or you rent or you rent out the property and you just take the cash. And there's more moving parts. You got to have like fake bank bank accounts and stuff. But scammers are catching on that this is a rarely prosecuted uh, crime. And um, I spoke with a, a attorney that was like kind of the preeminent deed fraud attorney. And the cases of this are really go are really ramping up. And the thing is, you can't stop it because you can't stop somebody from uh, falsifying a deed without completely like you know redoing the process of how that's all done. But what you can do is stop the damage that happens to it after after it's been deeded over to the criminal because that it's at that point that they can either sell it or um, or take out loans against the property. And so the software um, that I made is uh, it's called um, Title Fraud Defender. It basically just monitors your title, and if it changes, it'll it'll ping you and say, "Hey, Peter, uh, looks like your title's been changed to uh, to George," um, making sure that's cool. And if it hasn't, you're going to be like, whoa. And so you're going to call the county and be like, yo, this was wrong. And there's a whole process you got to go through from there. And we help you and we guide you through it. But so your software basically crawls all the public records type of a thing? Yeah. Yeah. It's pretty simple. It just, it, it's, gotcha. it scrapes through the public records, make sure that it's still in your name. And uh, if it matches up, great little check mark. But if it doesn't, it, it alerts you like right away. Gotcha. So David Green, the bigger pockets, David Green, oh, I know. had this, had this happen to him. He, 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 uh, my buddy Mark Ainley has a uh, real estate investor podcast in Chicago, and he and David Green was on his podcast, and I think he he was telling me that was the first time he like publicly talked about his experience with this. Like it happened to him, which is crazy. You know, you think he's probably you know the best of the best, and here he got taken advantage of. Yeah, yeah. There's no. Is, it can happen to anybody. Um. So there's a, a whole, there's a whole lot of uh, people that are you know like uh, elderly that it would be partic particularly uh, devastating for them. And then for real estate investors, like nobody's checking their deeds. But so what's the what's the it. consequence? What if you what if you can you prove this happened and is it the same premise? Like go try to squeeze blood out of a turnip, or do they will they put these people in jail if they catch them, or what does that look like? They will put them in jail, but they're rarely prosecuted. In this case, it's a little bit different than squatters because squatters, like yeah, they're they're like right there. But when it's like hey, well, it's a civil case, we can't charge these guys. With the deed fraud, rarely is the person, um, you know, outwardly and openly like deed frauding. They're trying to use like fake IDs. They're, you know, located, you know, another part of the country and tracking down somebody in a fraud case is extraordinarily difficult. You have to have the most of the guys that you read about, like going up the river and actually getting prosecuted and going to jail because it does happen. People do go to jail for this. Um, but most of the guys that uh, that happens to are guys that they do like 30 houses. 
And so if you type in like deed fraud conviction into Google, you'll, you'll hear about some of these guys, but it's the notorious mm -hmm. ones that have done this like over and over and over again. And they were just like doing it in their own name. It's like an open and shut case that they did over and over again. Whereas the more sophisticated ones that do like onesie twosies, um, you know, and they're never actually there and they're like, you know, getting mules to, to do things. Those guys just don't get caught. And they don't chase them down quite as often because, like, there was a cop that I spoke to who said, like, for every, you know, um, you, know you know, like, theft case that I can prosecute, which is, you know, kind of rare, like, uh, you know, I'm going to get, like, or for every 10 thefts, I'm going to get, like, one fraud case solved. So they're really hard to solve, essentially. Well, and then I don't even know, I don't know if the people in foreign countries are doing this or not, but there, I mean, there's a ton of scammers in Russia, Nigeria, all these other countries that forget about trying to catch them or hold them accountable oh know? heck yeah if they're out of the country forget about it so, i don't know if they're involved in deed fraud yet i'm sure it's coming if it's if it's easy takings you know they're, they're not far behind yeah no if i mean if there's an opportunity like you know <clears throat> look to them to do it and i don't want it to, t to take off but uh the trouble is whereby uh trying to spread the word about deed fraud you're also yeah. spreading the word that you know this is a crime hey criminals there's a crime that you can commit here and a lot of the feedback i got on the um, stole a house video was that they're like hey you're teaching people how to commit crime and my response to that was like look you can't get scammed if you know the scam everybody who's ever gotten scammed by something is probably not aware of like what the scam is that's being perpetrated they're not going to be able to recognize it whereas if you're aware of the scam like it's just it's a whole lot less likely to happen to you so yes like i'm maybe i've educated criminals somewhat because uh, some guy who thinks you know oh you know squatting oh maybe i should do that could be empowered but i like to think for every one of those there's a hundred people that are like okay whoa i need to protect myself i need to protect my property yeah. Yeah, yeah, it's unfortunate. And it, 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 I don't see it getting better in the short term. It's just getting worse, especially as, you know, the, the, the constraint supply is there. Prices keep going up there. Some people, you know, they don't they don't have a lot of options. It doesn't mean it's, it doesn't mean it's right. But I think it pushes people desperate times, you know, makes them do desperate things, desperate um, times. And houses are more valuable now than they've ever been in the history of the world. You know, yeah, it's it's it's, it's a profitable crime and you don't get caught. So, boom, there you got it. Yeah. Well, George, this has been great. Uh, good information. It's good to educate our listeners on what, you know, potentially can happen. And I, I'm in the same camp as you. Like, yes, we might be teaching some people how to do bad things, but that's on them, right? I, I'd rather teach the good people how to prevent those things from happening to them. That might make me help sleep, help me sleep better at night than, than the opposite. And just, yeah, I mean, everybody knows how to do a murder, right? Like, do you need to be taught how to murder somebody to, to know you shouldn't murder anybody? <laughs> All these things are bad. And um, I like to think for, um, you know, that we're, we're teaching prevention. We're teaching people how to not have this be a problem. And, and really it's like spreading awareness. And so that, you know, the rules can change. And so, and if I, you know, it turns out this is no longer needed because squatting and deed fraud is just no longer a thing. That'd be great because then I just don't have to worry about them anymore. And I can get back to my day job as a real estate investor. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. How, how, how much, of your capacity has this new venture taken from you? Oh, I don't know. It, it ebbs and flows. But once once we launch it, and we'll, uh, maybe 25%, I'm still a full-time real estate okay. investor and developer. But uh, I do love a good side hustle. I love a good side quest. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. you know, I can't, can't let a good opportunity pass me by. And plus, I feel like I can make a difference. So I'm going to lean into it. And if it turns out that I end up being the squatter guru of the entire nation and everybody looks to me and it turns out to be more lucrative than being a real estate investor, then heck, you know, then that's what I'll do uh, for the time yeah, being. That's, that's it's a good side thing quest. Too. Yeah. Good, good, good. Uh, awesome. I appreciate you coming on the show. It's been a great conversation. Uh, I'll, My pleasure, we'll man. Make sure we'll get all your links and put all your stuff in the notes and Hopefully we can bring more awareness to the topic. Awesome. Yeah, no, all listeners out there, uh, I, I'm, I'm an open book. Feel free to contact me on social media and uh, I'll be happy to hear from you. Yeah, we'll put all your links in the notes so they know how to get a hold of you. And it sounds like you're open to, to helping, which is good. I mean, that's what I like about real estate investing is it is competitive, maybe against somebody in your own local market, maybe, not always, but for, for the most part, people are crowd sharing information, strategies and tips and whatnot oh yeah is... i'm a real abundance mindset type of guy i share everything vendors contractors information yeah. i got you good 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 well you heard it here so if you have any questions about scotting or scotting <laughs> squatting reach out to george he he will give you some help for sure terrific
yeah, I'd love to hear from you.